I don't know of uh, <clears throat> any university class that does this, and I, I've known a lot of university classes, uh, because <clears throat> what we're doing is staying, uh, we're kind of transcending the disciplines, we're using the disciplines, but if a course like this were offered <clears throat> in a university, you'd have to put it in a department, right? And then that department's gonna have its allegiances and power structures and uh, you're not going to go. You're not going to do mythology if it's in political science, right? Mm -hmm. So we get to do this, and th this is actually a point that we'll come back to about power and knowledge. So tonight, distrust and desire, power and institutions, and the last two in the series next week and the week after, education and the individual. That's not accidentally placed. Um, we've gone through some pretty heavy duty power structures and forces that have that are arrayed against us and I want especially in the last two I've tried to do it all along and, and we have in our discussion certainly um, talk about agency how do you get agency we need to understand the forces arrayed against us first of all but then what can you do about it what's your agency how do you make change in the world Institution, the word from 1400, the action of establishing or founding a system of government from uh, institution, foundation, a thing established. Uh, from the Latin, a disposition, arrangement, instruction, or education, meaning established law or practice from the 1550s. Meaning, meaning establishment or organization for the promotion of some charity charity 1707 jocular or colloquial use for anything that's been around a long time comes from 1837 and our title tonight comes from a, basically an unfinished work of Mark Twain's uh, his last uh, called the mysterious stranger about an alien who comes to earth uh, his name is Satan by the way and he points out how we're screwing up. And the quote is this from Satan. Monarchies, aristocracies, and religions are all based upon that large defect in your race, the individual's distrust of his neighbor and his desire for safety or comfort's sake to stand well in that same neighbor's eye. These institutions will always remain and always flourish, and always oppress you, affront you, degrade you, because you will always be and remain slaves of minorities. He didn't, this is 18, he didn't mean it the way you, you may have heard it. There was never a country where the majority of the people were in their secret hearts loyal to any of these institutions. The the great story, excuse me, <clears throat> the great story of institutions begins in ancient Greece, 525 BCE, with a play called uh, the Oresteia by Aeschylus. It's a trilogy, it was actually a tetralogy, but the last play is lost. Uh, the Oresteia is, is by Aeschylus, who is a, probably the greatest playwright in ancient Greece, uh, he was writing his plays at an interesting time. He, land, he was part of the ancient and powerful landed families that controlled Greece for generations. But he had seen that power of the landed aristocracy um, diminished in his time. And um, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, he's, he's right around the cult of Demeter. Um, and there's lots going on uh, right around where Aeschylus grew up. Uh, in fact, he was charged with revealing one of the secret mysteries of Demeter in one of his plays. Uh, but 
he was exonerated because it was determined that he didn't mean, mean to do that. That's actually still going on now. Some Native American writers, for example, who are charged with revealing clan stories in their work. Well, Aeschylus would have observed firsthand the turmoil associated with the murder of one of the princes and the expulsion of his brother, the progression from tyranny to democracy in Athens meant that Aeschylus lost what he was born into, but thought it was a fair trade-off. Because in exchange for loss of his power, his family's power and the landed aristocracy, they got democracy. They got institutions. He was a soldier. And uh, in 458 BCE wrote the Oresteia. Let's look at the Oresteia. Again, one of the great plays ever, maybe the greatest play ever from ancient Greece. Uh, it's the story of the blood-drenched house of Atreus. And Atreus is, is um, I believe it's grandson of a man named Tantalus, uh, who is uh, a little too full of himself like Icarus and uh, tries to go too far, goes into the realm of the gods and is punished uh, in Tartarus by always having fruit and water just out of his reach. He's mired in this mud and he can't, and this beautiful fruit and the water's right there and he can't reach it. That's his grandfather. So this, this is not going to bode well, you can tell right from the beginning. So the play, you know, after, after the fall of Troy, we have the Aeneid, uh, Virgil's attempt to replicate what Homer did with the Odyssey. Um, and it's about Aeneas founding Rome, basically. The backside of the fall of Troy for the Greeks is not so glamorous because what happened was, if you remember, the Greeks win the Trojan War, but at a dear cost. Before they even set sail for Greece, Agamemnon is told by Apollo that he, if he's going to get, they're, they're in the doldrums, no wind, that if he wants wind, he has to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia. In the description of this sacrifice is brutal. Brutal. It's Lynchian, even. Um, very, um, well, it's just brutal. And then, but you probably don't even know that part. Most people who are familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey don't know that that's what started it. And of course, what started it before that was Helen and Paris and all that. So there's no Greek victory without. So in the story world, at least, there's no Greek victory without this heinous, horrendous sacrifice of a young girl who cries and kicks and screams as she's being murdered. Clytemnestra is her mother, and she has not forgotten this. So Agamemnon goes off for 10 years to fight the Trojan War. He comes back and she lies waiting uh, the whole time. She's taken 10 years to plot his assassination for killing their daughter. In the meantime, she's taken a lover, Aegisthus, and he too, as lovers do, wants revenge upon Agamemnon. She has a son by Agamemnon named Orestes. And so the play is about, is the Oresteia. It's the story of Orestes. Uh, she sends him away because she knows bad tidings await. Here's a line. Wisdom comes through suffering. Trouble with its memories of pain drips in our hearts as we try to sleep. So men against their will learn to practice moderation. 
favors come to us from God's really beautiful poetry and incredible pain in this play. And one of the things it does is introduce, not introduce, but it uses the chorus so deftly. So a rough, extremely rough analogy of the chorus would be like a voiceover, but even that's too small and basically incorrect. The chorus is often the voice of the gods or the voice of fate. It's the third person. It's you. It's the spectator being led to interpret things correctly in the Greek chorus. And there's wailing, and, and they too are very, very poetic. There's wailing, there's triumph, there's praise. The chorus, in other words, is another character, a, a very important character. Here's another one, uh, another quotation. For many men value appearances more than reality. Thus they violate what's right. Everyone's prepared to sigh over some suffering man, though no sorrow really eats their hearts, or they can pretend to join another person's happiness, forcing their faces into smiling masks. But a good man discerns true character. He's not fooled by eyes feigning loyalty, favoring him with watered down respect. This is important because there's a lot of trickery here going on, as you might guess, when you're assassinating your husband um, and your son has sent away and your lover's right there. Um, so the, uh, the play begins with the guards on the watchtower and, and they feel it because they're on the front lines. They, like, uh, they hear about Troy and then they're like, the fall of Troy, they're like, yeah, this is great, right? 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 They keep trying to tell themselves it's great. They know something's coming and it's not good. And sure enough, uh, Agamemnon arrives back from Troy and he has Cassandra with him, the um, Trojan prophetess. And uh, Clytemnestra tricks them, uh, brings them in, and murders them both, but not before Cassandra can utter a uh, a long soliloquy of prophecies about their doom, about Clytemnestra's doom, and ev the whole house of Atreus is going down. Um, uh, she sees Agamemnon's murder and her own son's murder, right? As, as well as the vision of the past crimes of the house of Atreus. And then she willingly, well, not willingly, but knowingly, goes into the house where she will be executed. Clytemnestra now is happy. She's waited 10 years for this. Compare her to beloved, faithful Penelope in the Odyssey, who doesn't raise a hand. She simply weaves, except it's not very simple at all. It's very complex. Clytemnestra takes matters into her own hands, as she should in ancient Greece. This is, this is blood vengeance. He killed, her husband killed their daughter. The ancient law, the natural law of the time was that he must be killed. And what mother wouldn't want to do that even today? So that's the first part of the play, the first volume of the play is Agamemnon. Next comes the libation bearers. This is the return of Orestes. And there's a reason I'm telling you this story. Just hang on. Like a good tragedy, wait until the end. He returns, uh, Orestes returns <coughs> after these many years of exile, urged on by Apollo. Now, anytime the gods are involved, they are, <laughs> they're just the worst. They're these competing entities always. And, even the competition gets leveled up, and finally Zeus has to, he's just impatient, he's just, whatever, this. It's not like, you know, he just doesn't want to be bothered. Um, but he has the final say. Um, and uh, Orestes gets this oracle from Apollo that he's to go back, return, take his friend, and then follow Apollo's instructions. The line here is, such oracles are persuasive, don't you think? 
And even if I'm not convinced, even if I'm not convinced, Orestes says, the rough work of the world is still to do. So many yearnings meet and urge me on. Oh my God, I love that. I love this play, these plays. Uh, he meets up with his sister, Electra, um, and they join forces to kill Clytemnestra, their mother. Um, but before they do that, there's a lot of ritual, as you might imagine. There's a lot of speaking, uh, <laughs> describing things, uh, which is why we like it. They, um, they invoke their father's ghost, Agamemnon's ghost, calling upon his aid in um, their pursuit of vengeance. And then they disguise themselves, Orestes and Pylades, his friends, dis disguise themselves to enter the palace. And they ask to meet, I guess, this Clytemnestra's lover. And as soon as they meet him, they kill him. Orestes says that the murder, they killed an honored man by cunning, his father, so they die by cunning, caught in the same noose. Clytemnestra pleads for her life. She pleads for her life with her son. And remember, what set this in motion was that her husband murdered their daughter. So now she's pleading for her life. But Pylades, in his only speech, reminds him that this is at the urging of Apollo, right? So, um, wait, my son, says the chorus, wait. So here, here's what's really interesting in the Oresteia, is that the chorus evolves along with the characters. So now they're saying, wait, my son, no respect for this child? The breast you held during the drow drowsing away the hours? Soft gums tugging the milk that made you grow? No respect for this? Ah, that's the key. No respect for this. No respect for this relationship of son to mother. No. No respect. And so he kills her. And while he is explaining to the chorus why he did, why he killed his mother and her lover, the Furies arrive. And the chorus says, for word of hate, let word of hate be said. Justice, stroke for bloody stroke must be paid. The one who acts must suffer three generations long. Three generations long, this law resounds. All right, so Orestes has come back after his exile with his friend and his sister. He, he does the murder. He kills Clytemnestra's lover and his mother <clears throat> at the urging of Apollo. The Furies, now these are ancient, ancient goddesses that are what we call chthonic goddesses. They're of the earth. They emerge out of the earth. They're that ancient. That's what that means. They're so ancient. Um, and so now they are pursuing Orestes, okay? Then the Eumenides. This, this is where it all ends and begins, as it were. Orestes flees to the sanctuary of Apollo in Ath uh, sorry, he, to the nearest sanctuary of, of Apollo. The ghost of Clytemnestra says this, you licked up many enough things from me, Orestes, my son. Libations without wine, plain offerings of appeasement, meals too, solemnized by night and burning altar hearts were my sacrifices. At an hour shared by no God, I raised you. You've, you've heard this from your mother. And yet I see all these healed and trodden down while the man has made his escape and is gone like a young deer. And lightly at that, he bounded from your nets, miss a great mocking leer at you. Sorry, <coughs> she's talking to the Furies, mocking them for letting Orestes get away. A great mocking leer at you. Hear me, I've been talking about my existence. Give it thought. You goddesses under the earth, I have been talking about my existence. 
I am Clytemnestra, and I call on you in your dream. <clears throat> so um, the Furies now become the chorus, and they, they fall asleep around Orestes as he's in front of the Temple of Apollo. Um, and Orestes is awoken, awakened by Apollo and says, go to Athens, you must go to Athens to seek justice from the patron deity of Athens, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. After he leaves, the ghost of Clytemnestra stirs, Clytemnestra stirs up the Furies to pursue him. And now, <coughs> I'm so sorry. And now we find ourselves in, um, in front of the court, the judicial court in Athens, the Areopagus court. The Furies are there as the prosecuting attorney, and Orestes is his own defense. The Furies say, see how you are pleading for this man's acquittal. When he has shed his mother's blood, his own kin's, on the ground, is he then to live in his father's house in Argos? And what altars is he to use? The public ones? What brother brotherhood will admit him to its rituals of sprinkled water? It's a law court now. We're in Athens. So it's moved into the judicial realm. And so the, the jury members vote, and it's a tie. Athena, having a vote, casts the deciding one and says that Orestes must be found innocent of killing his mother. She decides. The Furies are indignant. And she talks to them at great length, Athena. Now, the, the Furies are just what they sound like. They're furious at everything. Not at everything, but at, at some things. And, and they pursue people who have broken the ancient laws. Athena says, you have no place anymore. Things have changed. Paradigms shift because Orestes killed Clytemnestra. And he cannot be found guilty. And so I hereby rename you Eumenides, kindly ones. You ever want to see a myth in the process of changing? You ever want to see a culture in the process of changing? That's the beauty and terror of the Oresteia. Is it begins with a blood feud that we all recognize. We, we saw it in the Iliad. We see it everywhere in the ancient world. And it ends with a, tr a trial with a goddess of wisdom casting the deciding vote. And the vote is, is to move past the old tribal blood vengeance ways and to move into deliberation, into the court, into the judicial arena. This is how these things will be from now on. They will be tried according to reason and argument, not according to bloodlust. There's only one little trick there that I neglected to tell you. And that is that Athena, the great goddess, has to become a man to make this work. Because they cannot deny the blood vengeance of a mother. And so her argument before the court is that she is a man. And she says, hey, you know my story. Was I born of woman? No. She was born from the head of Zeus himself, from the head of Zeus, right? So that's why she's, that's one reason why she's the goddess of wisdom. She severs every connection to the feminine in order to do this. Rhianne Eisler in her book, The Chalice and the Blade, makes a lot of this, and I think for good reason. She talks about the cyclical nature of blood crimes, and it's horrible. She's not advocating for that. Who would advocate <coughs> for bloodlust and blood vengeance? But that was the ancient law. 
and the ancient law has now been changed. <clears throat> Ethics were not codified. And as you know from reading these ancient epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, they, they are at the whim of the gods, and it is a whim of the gods and goddesses that determine what happens. There's no larger system at work here. It's ultimately what Zeus wants, and Zeus is a giant id. That's all he is. He's not, a kid. I mean, he, he's related to mind, but he's just an id. He has desires and he fulfills them everywhere, willingly or not, on the part of his companions. So, this is a conflict between the old and the new gods. And to make that argument, Athena has to say that children, uh, ch uh, yes, sorry, Athena has to say that children are not related to their mothers. She says, Athena, the mother is no parent of that which is called her child. The mother is no parent of that which is called her child. She is only the nurse of the newly planted seed that grows. And why wouldn't she think that? That's how she was born. It's a little complicated because Zeus actually swallowed a woman who is pregnant, but we don't have to get into that. <laughs> Athena was born from the head of Zeus. I will show you proof of what I have explained, Apollo says. There can be a father without any mother. There she stands. Witness the daughter of Olympian Zeus, she who was never fostered in the dark of the womb, yet such a child has no goddess brought forth. And Athena responds. So now it's Apollo and Athena, right? Dionysus is nowhere around. That's too bad. There is no mother anywhere who gave me birth. She asserts, adding, and but for marriage, I am always for the male. With all my heart and strongly on my father's side. There's no secondary goddess. This is the goddess of Athens, except I guess we can't call her a goddess because she declares herself male. And of course, she's not talking about anatomy. She's talking about power, right? And so the chorus, the, the Furies, now called the Eumenides, express in horror. Gods of the younger generation, you have ridden down the laws of the old time, torn them out of my hands. Athena casts the deciding vote, and Orestes is absolved of the murder of his mother, because mother murder is not a crime. This is a significant movement in Western culture, right? I mean, this is the birth of institutions. It's the birth of institutions because an institution is something that's a product of a civilization. You can't have an institution without a civilization. There are a lot of other prerequisites for having an institution, but one of them is that you, that your power is taken out of your hands. That's the definition of an institution, is to give up your power. Any power that you claim to have, whether it's the power to, to murder your daughter, or, or murder her murderer, or murder her murderer's murderer. No. I mean, sure, you have the power to do that, but now that power will come at a great price. Um, there's a scholar named Joan Rockwell who writes about this, the use of literature in the systematic study of society. She says this, the Oresteia takes us from the full consent, from full consent to the justice of Clytemnestra's case in the first play, Agamemnon, to a point where her daughter is forgotten, her ghost is eclipsed, and her case non-existence non-existent because women do not have those rights and attributes which she had, she had claimed. If a mighty creature like Clytemnestra, with the provocation she has in the murder of her child Iphigenia, 
has not the right to take revenge, what woman has? This is, again, according to Rockwell, a masterful built, built, sorry, bit of cultural diplomacy. It is very important in an institutional shift that a leading figure of the defeated party is seen to accept the new power. Indeed, right? It is very important in an institutional shift that a leading figure of the defeated party, however that party is defeated, is seen to accept the new power. And that's exactly what happened. It's a brilliant move. And remember, Aeschylus is, he's part of the old school. He's part of the old paradigm. But he saw this happen right in front of his eyes. He saw the Athenian democracy emerge and the institutions like the court emerge with it. Now, many years later, our old friend Sigmund Freud took this up in a little book written later in his life called Civilization and Its Discontents. You may know that Freud was no fan of religion. Before this, he had written a book called The Future of an Illusion, uh, 1927, I think, uh, in which he talks about religion, of course, as an illusion. Uh, so this is a follow-up to Future of an Illusion. And he says, uh, he actually, it's a very personal book, book, actually, uh, which is odd for Freud. I know it sounds weird, but it is odd for Freud that he would write so personally. And he has a friend, um, I believe he's a rabbi, who talks about religion. He's an educated man, this rabbi, but he says religion has an important, is an important element in his life. And Freud says, I, I just don't understand it. So let me see if I can understand it. So this is what we get with Freud trying to understand what he called the oceanic feeling of religion. Now, of course, for Freud, it's going to be an oceanic feeling, right? It's going to be a feeling. And, but we know it, right? That oceanic feeling, that feeling like you're part of something so much larger than yourself that, that you're not in control. Uh, Rudolf Otto called it the feeling of mysterious, uh, tremendous mystery and fascination. Um, we know that feeling. I know I do. Um, and that has, in the most ancient way, been connected to religion. Sure, it doesn't have to be connected to a god. And the earliest experiences of this, no doubt, were not connected to a god. But they have become so. So Freud, what do you think Freud does? <laughs> He goes back to your infancy, yours and mine, and he says that infants learn to, dis to distinguish between the internal and the external world. All right. Uh, he watches his little nephew, I think it is, play a game, Fort Da, in German. It was pushing, throwing a toy away and then grabbing it and pulling it back. And it was this interaction with the external world that interested Freud because he thought that infants thought there was no distinction between themselves and the world initially. I don't know. I, I get really suspicious when people start telling me what infants think because I don't know how we know. Uh, and they're, 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 the inclination is simply too hard to resist to lay our stuff onto this poor infant who may not be thinking anything. Oh, I see what you're doing there. Yes. No, you don't. I mean, you really don't. You can guess. Whatever. Um, and he says this. Let's see. Sorry. Originally, the ego includes everything. Later, it separates off as an external world from itself. And psychologists still like to make a big deal of this. And I think for very good reason. Uh, Jacques Lacan, the French uh, psychologist, talks about the mirror stage where the child, the infant or toddler, whatever, sees himself in a mirror. I mean, that's got to be psychically significant, I would think, to not just recognize that there's a boundary between you and the world, but to recognize yourself in that world, outside of you, if that's what happens. I don't know. 
Here indeed, Freud says, we encounter a curious phenomenon. The relevant mental processes when seen in the mass are more familiar, more accessible to our consciousness than they can ever be in the individual. The individual is, the, is only the aggregation, you know, I'm not going to read this because it's, <laughs> sorry, it's just too Freud. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can get right to the point, Sigmund. Um, so I think you, you may know this. We operate according to the pleasure principle and the reality principle. According to Freud, the pleasure principle is located in the id, that part of our psychic structure that is, uh, wants only pleasure and to avoid pain. There's no rational process. It's biological. If you're hungry, you eat. Tension is created in the id. You release the tension. And the id is really dumb. I mean, it's stupid. And so the id will suck on a thumb when it's hungry. Because it doesn't know the difference. Because there's no reality principle at work. The id will eat a piece of cardboard because it's hungry. The id cannot distinguish. By the way, all our monsters are ids. It's a whole other course. Um, the, so that's the pleasure principle. Enhance pleasure, avoid pain. Basically, release the tension. Whatever tension is in your body, I was going to say in your mind, but I'm not sure that would work. For, anyway, whatever tension there is, release it. Whether it's sex, hunger, uh, whatever. But there is another principle. Like I said, the reality principle, and that is where the ego, something called the ego, takes those energies found in the id and says, ah, here. You, you don't want the thumb, trust me. You want the nipple. This is what you want. You don't want the cardboard. You want the french fry or the cob salad, whatever. Um, you see, the ego's like they're directing everything. OK, that's a nice little system, right? Um, but civilization and institutions come into play with a very different third thing called the superego. So we don't get to live just alone. We live with other people. And so, for example, the id may say, hungry, hungry, and, and may see a piece, your, your seatmate's food uh, in the restaurant, or your neighbor's food in the restaurant, the neighboring table. It says hungry, ego says food, go. Go take that food. Nothing wrong in that system. Reality principle at work, pleasure principle at work. The third principle is what keeps us from doing that most of the time. It's called the superego. This is the embodiment of society, its mores, its ethics that say, hey, you don't want to do that. And this is outside. This is the unique part of the, this element of the structure is that the it is biological, the ego is mind, but the superego is society. So, Freud says the superego is civilization. The superego is what tells us not to do something. The superego is what produces guilt. Because remember in that example, there would be no guilt if I ate Charlie's meal off from the table next to me. No guilt. Only <laughs> there might be some tension <laughs> that would need to be relieved. Um, but there's no guilt. The superego creates the guilt. This is, no, you don't want to do that. And it's, it, it's by its very nature, it's external. This plays into what Freud called the two drives. The libido, or life drive, the eros drive, which is designed to create, it's not just sex, but it is sex. It's everything that is life affirming versus Thanatos, which is the god of death, um, but the Thanatos drive, the death drive. And Freud says, we have that because of guilt uh, and all kinds of other things. But basically, for Freud, institutions are our fathers. We need them, but we hate them. 
They're the ones who tell us what we can't do, but they're also the ones that provide the food. Now, here's Michel Foucault. He's going to talk about three books. Three, bo three instances of power in three places. So sexuality in the home. Um, Freud, <laughs> sorry, Foucault, is very difficult, so forgive me if I sound inarticulate, but read Foucault sometime. It's, uh, he's, he's rather dense, but I think very important. He says this, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> it, it's a direct response to Freud. He says that we think of sexuality in terms of the repressive hypothesis, and he especially focuses on the Victorians. And you know the story about the Victorians, right? They're so repressed. <laughs> right? What are you, Victorian? Um, <laughs> Freud says, Freud, see, there's a Freudian slip again. <laughs> you can't get out of it. Um, Foucault says, I don't see that. He's a historian, he's a philosopher, he's a theorist. Here's what he says. I see, Freud says, Foucault says, I see an explosion of talk about sex in the Victorian era. An explosion. Let me see if I have a quote for you. Yes, rather than the uniform concern to hide sex, you know those Victorians, rather than a general prudishness of language, you know how they talked, or didn't, what distinguishes these last three centuries is the variety, the wide dispersion of devices that were invented for speaking about it, for having it be spoken about, for inducing it to speak of itself, for listening, recording, transcribing, and redistributing what is said about it. Around sex, a whole network of varying, specific, and coercive transpositions into discourse into language, into ways of talking about something. Rather than a massive censorship, beginning with the verbal proprieties imposed by the age of reason, what was involved was a regulated and polymorphous incitement to discourse. Sex then becomes an object of knowledge, and it does in the 19th century. Not incidentally, uh, an early 20th century, not incidentally, going along with Freud. Freud's the exemplar of this. Sex becomes a kind of truth now, a product of discourse. Foucault says this, we demand that sex speak the truth, and we demand that it tell us our truth, or rather the deeply buried truth of that truth about ourselves, which we think we possess in our immediate consciousness. You know what he's talking about, right? I mean, sex. When you have sex, there's a truth there. There's, there's no other form of communication like it, right? It exposes, reveals things we think that we didn't know but wanted to, or perhaps didn't. Now he says, what, emer what happens is when you mark, when you create a new discourse, you never create it in a void. Every discourse is a discourse of power, and power over life. It's no accident that after the 19th century, <coughs> when sex becomes a, a kind of discourse, that we get masters, and eventually we get masters in Johnson, we get the sex studies, we, and this is Foucault's point. Suddenly, everybody's talking about sex. In the, starting in the Victorian era. All right. This is his move. Uh, this is always Foucault's move, is to show, is to try to get behind the discourses that we take for granted. Um, I would say, he would abhor this, but I would say you're trying to find the myth. You're trying to find the story that's shaping you that you kind of know is there, but you can't quite nail it down because it's holding you so tightly. 
He does this with sex. He does this with madness. So he has a book called Madness and Civilization, A History of Insanity in the Age of Reason. Same move. Uh, people know what they do, he says. Frequently they know why they do what they do. But what they don't know is what what they do does. And that's it. That's Foucault in a nutshell. What is the power? <coughs> what are the effects of power upon what you do? And more importantly, the discourse you use to talk about it. And he made a great deal in this book uh, of the Ship of Fools, which I'm going to skip over, but it's a great story about uh, well, the ship of fools, um, a ship uh, adrift in the ocean run by a captain who knows a little bit, but just enough to get everybody in trouble and everybody's clamoring to take over the ship. Uh, it's a great metaphor for a great many things. There's the Bosch of it. He says that served, that notion of the ship of fools, of madness as being unusual of madness as being closer to the edge of another world, as opposed to madness being clinical. When madness becomes clinical, that is an exercise in power. Every use of language is an exercise in power, but this was a different exercise in power, according to Foucault. It gives birth to the asylum where people now are not treated as odd or perhaps having a special wisdom as they were up until the Enlightenment, the age of reason. Now they are clinical. They have a problem and we can cure it. All this comes out of the notion of the Enlightenment, that with our vast superiority of knowledge, we can fix things. We can fix sex. We can fi fix insanity. And this is not, this is not uh, abstract. Um, I, uh, I used to work in a community mental health center. And I would spend time with our clients. I would spend several hours a day with our clients. And it was a community mental health center. So uh, we rarely saw a psychiatrist in the building. But we had this guy who would come in. We had lots of psychologists but no psychiatrist, and we had this guy who would come in, I'll never forget, Dr. Asher, and he would meet with our clients, my clients, uh, the people I'd spent most of my day with, and he would say, does Clyde need to be committed? And I'm like, dude, I have a master's degree in philosophy, what do I know? He's like, well, you've seen him. And I'm like, oh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> you are not going to get me to take away this man's rights because I don't have the power or the authority or the knowledge. He's like, well, you see him and I don't. And so, you know, a couple times this happened is I had to report on the behavior, which one time involved Clyde breaking a mason jar and holding it up to me. So I had to report that. And he's like, yeah, he's in. And I'm like, oh my God, these are just words. Except they're not. Words got this man's rights taken away from him, put in an asylum, a center, and pumped with Thorazine. Words did that. And, and it's not just any words. Um, Christo will tell you the exact words you need. It's in a book. The DSM, what is it? I don't know. Yeah. It's in a book. You just consult the book. And that's how you determine when people are insane. Now, whereas before they were just sometimes fun, sometimes annoying, the whole tradition of the fool comes out of this. And the fool is often de de depicted as a wise person, inadvertently wise. The Fisher King, right? Anyway, sorry, going on and on. Discipline and the prison. Discipline and punish is the book, The Birth of the prison, prison. I think you see what's happening here. Same thing. He's going to look at this institution and notice what's happening in terms of power and discourse. 
That's a panopticon, an ab abandoned panopticon in Cuba, which looks pretty amazing. But this was an invention by a prison reformer, reformer named Jeremy Bentham, who was also a philosopher, 18th century. He thought this would be better. Foucault doesn't say anything's better or worse. He's trying to be a historian. And he's like, sure, um, treatment of criminals before the Enlightenment was horrific, but in terms of societal functions, what he calls epistemes, it had an interesting function and reaction. So for example, he said public executions often, often would result in riots on behalf of the prisoner. Because it was public. You could see it. You could see it in all its grisly gore. This human being like me being executed by a power that I don't participate in. Sure, many of them were grisly and gory and horrific and this was an improvement in some case. That's not his point, he doesn't care about that. What he says is, look what happens when you turn it into private, into a private sphere instead of the public sphere. And that's the function of the panopticon. You see the tower in the center and then the prisoners are around. The guard in the tower can see everything, see right? Of course, this is 18th century. We know, we know the panopticon. We carry it around in our pockets, right? Or on our wrists. Now, here's Foucault's point too about the prison, is this. Eventually, you don't need a guard because the prisoners are going to assume that they're being surveilled. And why wouldn't they? It's, it's endemic of the power structure in the society. Um, a literary theorist named Louis Althusser has a concept called, he calls interpolation, where he talks about how your submissiveness your lack of power is embedded in the systems in which you live. And his example is this. You're going down the street and a cop says, hey you, you is indeterminate. How many of us are gonna turn around? Most, I would say, because we're embedded, implicated in the system of power. This is Foucault's point as well. And so there's a whole now, system, episteme, way of knowing, way of talking about the carceral, that which involves prisons. And for, oh, I have a great quote here. Let me give it to you. Let's see. For, I'm sorry for the sniffling. Oh, well, this goes to what I was just saying. Foucault, discipline and punish, but let there be no misunderstanding. It is not that a real man, the object of knowledge, philosophical reflection, or technological invention has been substituted for the soul, the illusions of theologians. The man described for us whom we are invited to free, the prisoner, is already in himself the effect of a subjection has already in himself the effect of a subjection more profound than himself. A soul inhabits him and brings him to existence, which is itself a factor in the mastery that power ex exercises over the body. The soul is the effect and instrument of a political anatomy. The soul is the prison of the body. The soul is the prison of the body, not the body is the prison of the soul. The aim of the prison and of the carceral system is to produce delinquency, to produce crime as a means of structuring and controlling it. From this perspective, they succeed. The prison is part of a network of power that spreads through society, which is controlled by the rules of the strategy alone. Foucault didn't see this, but he could have foreseen it. 
the carceral institution in the United States where prisons are now run by corporations. What do corporations need? Clients. And so the aim of the prison is, produ is to produce crime so that it can be structured and controlled. So much we could talk about here, but let's end with our good friend Manley Hall. There he is, right at that door. This is a little essay called Who is to Blame? <laughs> and he talks about criticisms of institutions. What do we mean when we say that science is unenlightened or education is inadequate or that religion is creed bound? For that matter, what do we mean by unenlightened, inadequate, and creed bound? Having delivered such solemn <coughs> pronouncements, we may even regard ourselves as emancipated. Um, he continues, on circumstantial evidence, the institutions are held responsible for our disasters. It has not occurred to the average person to suspect that the real causes of our troubles are deeper and more personal than the institutions which we censure. We are blaming, we're always blaming some vast intangible for the failures of progress. And we have over, and I would add personal progress. And we have overlooked those peculiarities of mortal nature which cause the human inhabitants of the planet to perpetuate the ills which most afflict them. What can institutions do to this rugged individualism which causes average folks to do as they please regardless of the consequences? The 20th century has inherited from the past a wonderful legacy of learning no normal person can reach maturity without being exposed to the opportunities for self-improvement and empowerment. Can words change those who are untouched by even pain and tragedy? Progressive leaders in all departments of science, education, and religion can present irrefutable documentary evidence that the real cause of our mundane confusion is the absolute egocentricity of its private citizens. If we assume that institutions survive because they are sanctioned by the individual citizen, then the citizen himself, in turn, depends upon institutions for his own security. He's echoing Freud here. A vicious circle that can result from ignorance and indifference. What's required? Education, focus, a perfect but with an understanding of the effects of what power will do when a person tries to become self-empowered. He says, a progressive teacher may find himself out of employment and promptly forgotten by those he tried to serve. As long as there is no clear indication that the public will protect its champions, we cannot expect others to hazard their careers for us. There must be he continues, an honorable desire to be honorable. This can be strengthened if it is present, but it cannot be created if the essential materials are absent. Education can only fit us to express ourselves skillfully and efficiently. <clears throat> it can teach us to use what we have and what we are to the best advantage. It does not, however, increase the actual, actual substance of what we have and what we are. Finally, and in closing, progress is an accumulative motion through time, which gradually moves collective mankind from one level of understanding to another. It is hazardous to assume that we can immediately attain that which others of equal or greater ability have been unable to attain. This is not a case for discouragement, but rather a recognition that patience is indeed a virtue of the wise. Thank you.